So welcome everyone and um, it's a pleasure to be here on uh, Men's Health Week for a, a round table discussion. Um, Men's Table started back in 2019 so this is our, our fourth uh, Men's Health Week and uh, we, we're learning more about um, men and men's health and men's issues as we go and really delighted to have um, uh, plenty of people joining us on the webinar and also the three of you panellists which I'll introduce to you just just a moment. Um, would like to acknowledge uh, the um, traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet. Uh, I'm up in uh, Sydney here, so the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And um, the, the three panellists are spread out across different parts of, um, of the country. And so wherever uh, you are um, joining us from as well, I uh, just want to pay our respects for the um, elders past and the emerging leaders um, and, and the current Indigenous peoples who stewarded our lands for a long, long time. Um, so welcome again. Um, the theme for this year's Men's Health Week is building healthy environments for men and boys. And we wanted to have a diverse range of men come along and join us to express some views and share some stories and experiences that you've had around this theme. So I just wanted to take a moment to introduce our three panellists. Um, firstly, um, Jeremy Tor. Um, Jeremy was born in England, but now happily resides in uh, Lonnie, as they say, or Launceston, Tasmania. Um, has worked, amongst other things, as a sailor and as a journalist, and has been a member of a, a men's table in Launceston, MT14, for about three years. And Jeremy, when I asked about a, a, uh, some, some, a fun fact, you said you enjoy riding your motorbike and um, looking at clouds. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, and Lawrence Mitchell. Lawrence is the CEO for um, the Wellbeing at Work um, Australia Asia Pacific Group and founder of Finding Equilibrium that helps people to find balance across five key pillars of health and wellbeing. Um, Lawrence is based in Sydney um, in, in uh, Sutherland Shire and he's been part of um, the men's table down south, MT26, for over 12 months. And Lawrence um, is an astrologer. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's good to be here. And Andrew, Andrew Watts. Andrew lives in Gerringong on the south coast of New South Wales, works part-time as, um, as the Berry Uniting Church Minister and also work, working with uh, aged care uh, chaplaincy um, and has been a member of a men's table since December 2019. And Andrew, you love singing bass in choirs. Welcome. Yeah, singing bass. Yeah, too right. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Um, so, healthy environments uh, for men and boys. Let's start with um, an experience that you've each had. Um, maybe an example of either a healthy environment that you've had in your life that contributes to your well being. Or indeed, because it's men and boys, it might be um, something to do with your son's well-being. I know each of you have got sons. Um, or as an example of an environment that you've been in that wasn't so healthy for you. Um, we'd love to hear, hear a story from each of you about either of those choices. Who'd like to go first? I'll go if you like. Um... Uh, in the intro there, you mentioned a couple of jobs I've had. So um, at one stage, I had both, two, like two half-time jobs, um, one in aged care chaplaincy and one at the congregation ministry in Berry. And um, uh, I had a, a restructure, something that's very common these days. Institutions love to restructure, don't they? <laughs> um, in the uh, aged care part. And, of course, we hear on the news that aged care providers are going, going through all sorts of difficulties. So that's partly why you get restructures. And um, anyway, that uh, ended up being, like, like many restructures, they're made for other reasons other than uh, human being reasons. And um, it meant a lot of extra work was expected of the workers, uh, in our case, uh, pastoral care workers. And um, so I kind of had extra responsibilities and two half-time jobs in the first place, especially if they're in the caring industry, uh, are really tough because everyone seems to want to do more than 
the actual allotted hours. And uh, I just sort of, drew, I was wanting to do the right thing and wanting to do the best by by the residents and the clients and uh, and my fellow workers. And um, I was just doing too much work. I was just exhausted, completely exhausted and wearing myself out such that I had a, ended up having a car accident because I fell asleep at the wheel, <laughs> literally driving from one of the halftime jobs. No, no. Two of the centres I had to watch because of the restructure. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, no no physical damage. Oh, well, apart from the cars. The cars had a bit of minor physical damage, but in terms of people, I didn't have any physical hassle and the other person had a scratch on a hand. That was it. So that was very fortunate. It was in a low speed spot after getting off the freeway. But that that tiny little accident was enough to go, woo. <laughs> and, and just thinking about it all, thinking I was literally, I'd literally disappeared for a few moments, you know. I, I ceased to exist for a few moments that I cannot account for. <laughs> and just my thoughts just went down that track. And uh, so that led to a major rethink and talking to others of course and talking to myself or listening you know just getting out for a week fortunately my workplace allowed that to just get out and have time to sit down and think in in quiet and silence so yes I was talking to others but also time on my own mm. uh, which suited mm, thanks my Andrew personality yeah and I, I, I changed, you know, I pulled out of one of my jobs and, mm. um, to survive. Well, I'm, I'm glad you only came away with a, a few bumps and scrapes. It's a lucky outcome, um, but a great example of um, an environment that was, yeah, just basically overworked. Thank you. Lawrence, what's, um, what's been your experience? Sure. So it's so already building on the, on the um, I guess, the topic of work. So when I look back, I've, I've lived in um, Australia now for... Uh, five and a half years, believe it or not. And prior to that, I was based in London and I worked for one company for 15 years. Um, and I realised when I look at that whole period of my life that that was a very healthy environment. So I stayed for 15 years. And when I kind of think what was healthy about it, it kind of really, in my mind, it, it breaks down into three areas. So there was a healthy physical environment. So during the period that I was there, there was a, a lot of focus on changing the office layout, creating zones, really a real focus on light and uh, and on the, on the physical attributes that really impact us from an from an environmental point of view but then the second area was very much around the emotional environment and the psychological environment which is so important when it comes to us as as, um, as, as, as humans. And when I look at what were the components of that organization that really supported my emotional and my psychological well-being, they were really good leaders. I worked with some really good leaders who role modeled behaviors that set the tone of the whole organization. There was also, um, it was a learning culture. I think uh, when, um, when, when whatever age you are, I think as humans, we are, we are, driven to learn and to grow and when you work for a, for an organization that really supports that that's incredibly um uh, incredibly um energizing and there's also a lot of mentors and then the third uh, the third area that really supported that healthy environment was connection there was a real community environment and often we don't think of workplaces as communities but that's what it was. You know, when you work for one company for 15 years and a lot of people were around for that amount of time, you 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 um, travel through life together. You see people through the ups and downs. And that's really community. And when you feel that you are part of a community and you get that sense of belonging and, and that feeling of inclusion, then that's for me, that's the foundation of well-being. You know, if we feel we belong, then ultimately we feel that we're um 
you know, we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So for me, it was that experience working for 15 years. As I say, when I joined that company, I thought I'd only be there for a couple of years. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But I, that I was there for so long. But I became marketing, uh, chief marketing officer, and I, and I became part of that leadership um, team. And really, it was the community and creating that community vibe that I uh, really supported because that, for me, is, so, is such a key part of a healthy environment. Mm, wonderful. Thanks, Lawrence. We've got quite a few of the um, guests uh, attending the webinar today uh, through the um, Prima EAP uh, organisation who are very focused on workplace wellbeing. So thanks for their support. But um, yeah, great to hear that there's such a, a positive experience you had. I guess many people wouldn't have had that fortune in their careers to have such a healthy place. Jeremy. Uh, yes, well... <clears throat> I have to admit, I'm, uh, I'm kind of winging it a bit here um, because I'm probably the oldest person here today and I haven't been in, a, in an employed situation for quite a long time or at least not employed by a, an organization, I've worked as a freelance for a long time. And I think part of the ability to do that and work as an individual, but along with other groups. And I'm kind of looking back a bit here, but I'll, I'll connect it to a men's table issue if I can. I remember growing up as a kid um, in a small rural village in Northamptonshire in England. And I always remember and it's peculiar. I've only, as I said, I'm winging it. And I'm only just thinking about it now, really. One of the most important things that I remember from growing up as a child was sitting around the family table at uh, mealtimes and discussing things. And nobody was ever, as a part of that meal table, a senior or a junior or a learner or a teacher or anything. We were all just treated as equals, whether it was my mother talking about something, my father, my brother, a uh, different brother, didn't make any difference. We were all just equals. And I think that really laid such a strong foundation for me. And it's certainly something that I've really tried to do very strongly um, with our sons and, and our daughter is to treat them as people and just and not necessarily agree with them, not necessarily question everything they do, not necessarily give answers to every question that they ask, but just say, you're a person. You might be younger than me. You might be older than me. You might be more experienced than me. You might be a complete you know, beginner at the thing that you're talking about, but it doesn't make any difference. You're a person and you have an equal voice. And I think that's something that really came home to me at a recent men's table when we had a session and uh, the people that are interested in joining the table, I think just to outline what we do is that we don't necessarily try and fix things. We don't necessarily try and butt in or comment or anything. We just try and understand and listen. And at the end of one session, uh, one of the other members of our table said to me, you're really good at asking questions. And I just felt, wow, that goes right back to when I was a kid sitting around a table with the rest of my family. And I had no hesitation whatsoever in asking a question if I didn't understand. And then other people, if they felt like it, would help me. If they didn't, mm. if they didn't know, they would say, I don't know. Let's see if we can find out. And mm. that, to me, is something that the men's table has... Uh, has really benefited me immeasurably in that people will listen and they will treat you like an equal. And those two things to me, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm kind of winging it today. I hadn't even thought about that before, but there's something that's very much in common. So, no, Thank you, Jeremy. And a great uh, link between a, a healthy family environment and then what you're now experiencing at a men's table, that ability just to be present with each other as humans and really listen and take the yeah. time in to have good dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also didn't prepare specifically and, and didn't think I'd share too much, but I did want to just chip in an experience of my own. I forgot to introduce myself to I'm David Poynton, uh, one of the co-founders of the men's table. 
and also a member of the first um, uh, table that started back in 2011. But just as you were, you were chatting, um, I thought about my, my son, who's uh, 27. He only just recently returned about two weeks ago from two and a half years in Japan. And um, he found himself, I think, inadvertently in a healthy environment because of the choices he made. Um, he went over there to work in the ski fields in Japan in the winter of 2019 and 2020. And um, then COVID came near the end of that, um, that period in the March of 2020. And whereas uh, most of the people who were working in the ski fields cleared out and headed back to their homes a lot in Australia, he, he said, you know what, I'm going to stay put. I, I'm going to hang it, uh, sit it out here in Japan. And I've been saying to people, uh, he's probably one of the very small percentage of people who are going to look back on the years of COVID and go, oh, that was a, that was a great adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess the, the reason I, I, I name it is because in, in, in many ways, the healthiness that he experienced partly was he ended up in a beautiful, living in a beautiful mountain environment, but also because he made a choice just to kind of follow his own path. And, and to not go mainstream and go, all right, I better get back to safety. And he didn't know what was coming, but just made that choice to, to back himself in and, and take a bit of a risk. And it really served him well. You know, when we saw him two weeks ago, he's grown so much from that experience over the last two and a half years. So um, I guess there's another version of healthiness, isn't there, is, is following your own path and trusting in your own intuition and, and gut feel about what What's next for me? You know, what should I do in this circumstance? Um, going back to your experiences, and we don't have to sort of stay in, in lockstep order. So wh whenever you feel like uh, sharing, just uh, just pop when you're ready kind of thing. Um, but I suppose just why a healthy environment is important to you, given the, the, the experience you shared and the many others, no doubt, you've had. Uh, why a healthy environment is important to you and, and indeed boys. I can go if you like. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things I mentioned about um, our family, our boys and uh, and daughter as well, don't want to leave her out, otherwise she might get annoyed, um, is just to um, provide a situation, and again, parallel with the men's table, where it's okay to say anything. Never try and be in a situation where... Um, you're a little bit wary about saying things. And uh, it, it was something that I grew up with, and we've tried to do that with our children. And um, their, their lives haven't been all kind of plain sailing. They've had a few ups and downs. And um, one of them has separated from his wife and can't see his child as often as he would want to. And it's really tough, but it's the, the ability that I think he has developed to ring me up and say, dad, I'm feeling really rubbish at the moment. And it's okay to say that. And I, I feel really proud of him for being able to do that. Just that allowance of space to say things. That's very important. Yeah. Mm. I can, I can go next. If, uh... If you like, you I, I, I guess in answer to the question, why is a healthy environment important? I guess when I listen to everybody speak, the word that comes to my mind is culture. When you've got a healthy culture, whether it's at family or whether it's at work, it kind of sets the tone and it sets the, the behaviours that are required. And when that's healthy, that leads to healthy behaviours where people really feel that they can be themselves. And I feel when we talk about men and boys, sometimes there's a, a stereotypical or a culture that expects a certain type of behavior from men. And sometimes that's very unhealthy. And if you feel that you can't actually be who you are and you can't be yourself, then of course, no matter what the physical environment's like, you just feel um, separate and disconnected, mm -hmm. and which leads to you know, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems. So I feel when you find an environment that really, you know, comes back to what I said before about belonging and feeling included, and whether it's family, whether it's on a ski resort, whether it's at work, ultimately we have culture. And when you've got a healthy culture, that really supports healthy 
people um, and when you feel aligned, it really makes sense. And I'll just tell you one, one, one story because I shared before that I worked for one company for 15 years and it was overall a healthy culture. But there was a, there was a, the, the company went through a lot of change um, during that period. And there was a period where it was buying other companies. And I really learned about culture because when you buy other companies, of course, people come into your environment that have grown up in a very different culture. So their behavior is very different and it can take you can destroy a culture really quickly. That's what I learned because people came in with very different values because ultimately it comes back to the values of, 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 a, of a group. And if those values are aligned, then of course you really have um, you know, positive relationships and positive, um, positive cultures. But when you bring people into a, an environment who don't share those values, that of course can really create conflict and problems so it taught me a lot about culture it taught me a lot about values and it taught me a lot about myself you know during during those um, those years really working through a lot of change and fluidity because the the industry i was part of was publishing and when you work in in publishing as i do you learn all about change from from day one because the entire industry completely completely changed and digitized and so healthy environments for me are really important and it comes comes down to culture and then the routines and the habits that are part of that that culture mm. thanks lawrence and you andrew why are healthy environments important to you uh because it's life-giving um, yeah he a healthy environment's life an unhealthy environment is destructive of life and so a healthy environment helps us to be fully human and and to have joy and love and growth and beauty and all the wonderful things of life but like like jeremy says it's not all rosy you know you have we have our we all have our ups and downs uh i certainly have but my kids have and um you know one one boy in particular at the moment is really struggling in his early 20s but the um the, and, and that's going to happen in life but the healthy environment isn't about it always being positive it's about mm. it's about getting through <laughs> the ups and downs and um trying to like uh, uh, one one writer I enjoy, Richard Raw, who talks about, um, and he does a bit of work on men, but uh, you might have an ordered life and things are going nice and then something happens and just you get chaos and craziness and maybe going downhill a bit. And then it's a matter of not going back to the order, but keeping on going through that difficult stuff, through the suffering, through the struggles with the healthy environment and culture, as Lawrence was talking about, um, to get into a new space mm. where you probably have grown and you've got an extra depth to your life because you've been through something terrible <laughs> um, and you've built up some of the relationships and you've built up the strength and, and you're in a new space. But it's not always easy getting there, but the healthy environment can help you get through those difficult times mm. to, to have life and enjoy life. Yeah. yeah. We'd love to build on that um, that theme that you've opened up there, Andrew, and hear from each of you on, on that potential transition from a difficult place or maybe an unhealthy environment toward um, a healthier environment and a healthier life. Um, I don't know if any of you have got a story that comes to mind of, of making that transition yourself. Uh, and, and, and I suppose what I'm particularly interested in, because there'd be a lot of uh, viewers on the panel who might be in a difficult um, situation. They might have a, an unhealthy, you know, psychosocial environment. You know, the group, the culture that they're in is not serving them. Or, or maybe as per your story initially, Andrew, they just overworked or, or whatever else is going on. It'd be nice to think we could just tease out between the experiences we've had here um, any kind of clues or cues or, or tips or ideas of how people might move to, from a, a more unhealthy environment toward um, a healthier 
um, place, space, um, environment. Um, any of you have got a, an experience of navigating that that journey um, and or just any tips or suggestions to, to the audience about what they could do if they were in an unhealthy environment? Mm. I mean, I, I, I can go if, if you like. I, th I think what Andrew said kind of really kind of sort of highlights the problem that we all face and um, that life is full of ups and downs. That's why I call my brand Equilibrium because it's always about finding balance. And, and when, when I kind of look at the, the way we are, we, we do have a negative bias. So it's, um, it's um, and that's something we've been biologically programmed. So we naturally do focus on the on the negative one thing I, I do every day just to really help to, to find the balance is I keep a I, I, I keep a, a, a journal so every day I reflect on the day before and I really focus on what what are the things in that day so like in the morning you look back at the day before what are the things that actually energized me gave me positive energy and then what are the things that actually took away my energy because sometimes when you're in an environment you don't actually realize it's negative because it becomes normal and that, that's what I see a lot of, in my work is that we put up with bad behavior from colleagues, from clients, from family, because it's become normal. It's become culture, but it's not normal. And I guess the big thing is when you start by understanding where your starting point is and by writing it down, if that helps, then you can really understand what your situation really is in a balanced way, because there's always going to be positives. There's always going to be um, challenges. But then you focus on those challenges and then figure out what you can do about it. And sometimes you can't find those um, those answers yourself. You know, support systems like the men's table, of course, is great to be able to share those challenges and just the actual um, um, mechanism of vocalizing what's actually going on for you can really help to find solutions. Sometimes you might need more specialist help, but there's always a solution, no matter how bad the situation may seem. And you know, in my life and my work, I've seen I've seen some you know very challenging situations, and I think that's one of the benefits of getting a bit older. Is you look back and you realize I actually got through this. I don't know how, but it did make you it, it makes you stronger. Um, in terms of being able to go through that. So I think ultimately, whatever the situation that you're in, realize that you do have a choice. There are solutions and the journey to that transition may be uncomfortable, but I don't know anybody who's actually kind of um, moved through a very challenging period and got come through the other end who looks back and regrets that um, that journey so um, yeah so that's what that's um you know a couple of thoughts in terms of how to actually transition and um, mm -hmm. from where you are to a um uh, to a you know to a better place thank um, you uh oh all right um yeah i'll i'll um add to the about learning about just yourself first um and Lawrence tapped on that in terms of, you know, where I find energy and where I lose energy. That, that um, is a bit about some of our different personalities, the way what, what, what makes us tick and what, what works for us each, you know. So that helps in trying to find, because it'll be different. You know, when I look at my boy, my two sons, for example, they're quite different personalities. And, and, one of them just loves being out and about and as many as people as possible, you know, he just thrives on it, loves it. And, you know, when the pandemic came and, uh, and the lockdown stuff, boy, did that hit him. <laughs> it really knocked him sideways. And and he had to, yeah, we, we did get some help for him there. Um, whereas the other fella, uh, he, he didn't, took it in his stride. He didn't worry at all. <laughs> Um, he seems to be all right more time on his own, um, but that and, and I'm a bit like that. So I think I I, I need I learned about what makes me tick and what makes me not tick, and and knowing that if I'm with people all the time, that I'm just going to get exhausted and worn out, and so I had to build in. Um, moments like Lawrence is saying, work around and adjust things so that there's more balance in energy in, energy out stuff. Mm. Um, 
at work wise, uh, in in some professions you have professional supervision, and in mine we do. Um, so that's not like a line manager; that's like someone external, like mm. you were talking about EAP. It's a bit some somewhere along those lines, but it's kind of a consistent person you're talking to all the time. So that's a helpful thing for me and my style of things. Uh, I also have a mentor that's separate to that. Um, who's a kind of, I, I kind of call him like an elder in, in the Aboriginal sense, you know, that's, mm. that's kind of his role, you know, he's a, someone I can chat to who's been through all the sort of worky stuff that I've, I'm going through and he's good like that. And uh, the men's table has been good because that stretches me a bit more because it's a group and I wouldn't naturally go towards a group, but um, because it's a group that is, a consistent group and and not full of strangers all the time. Over time, you, you're coming closer and closer sort of thing and getting to know each other. So and that stretches me a bit more because I'm sharing a lot more to not just one or two close people. Yeah, and mm. I'm finding that helpful. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Seeking a mentor or an elder, really important part of anyone transitioning and learning about life and navigating the, the challenges. I, um, I'll share a couple of quick things from my experience. Um, I think one thing occurs to me is, is the courage at times uh, to, to know when something has come to an end and to leave. And at other times, uh, when there's a yearning or a, an opportunity and the willingness to jump in and start something or have a go at something new. And they might might coexist alongside each other, but I've been in situations where there was a toxic um, management and I just realized this is no longer, you know, a good place to be. And at the same time that the brain goes, yeah, but, you know, where else are you going to get a job or what are you going to do without the money? Uh, didn't have another job lined up. But realizing one day, hang on, I, I've just got to finish. I've got to end this. I've got to leave. And that was uh, an opportunity, I think, that, you know, opened up a big uh, wide field of, okay, I don't know what's next, but I'm now in a healthier space. Um, and then other situations I've had where something starts to murmur or call me and it's like a distant opportunity. It's not very clear what it is, but okay, I'm going to lean into that. I'm going to find out what is this thing? Uh, have a go, start doing something voluntarily. Um, and, and, you know, the men's table as an organization popped out of one of those moments where, um, you know, based on uh, a female friend just tapping me on the shoulder saying, I'm doing this women's work, you know, what are you doing about men's work? And I, at, the, at the time, I was fairly open in my life to what's next. And I thought, yeah, w w what about uh, taking what we've been doing at MT1 to others? And so Ben and I started chatting and, and very quickly realized we, we've got something here that's very, very strong in our lives. Let's see if other men would like to do it. And, and now there's 62, um, after tonight, perhaps 63 tables um, out there. So um at times, the willingness to lean in and have a go at something new to, to, to pull us toward a healthy environment or a new challenge, a new opportunity. If I can jump in there, David, just to kind of add to what you were talking about and also Andrew and Lawrence pulling them, you know, all together. I think one thing that the, the men's table accentuates is it highlights the opportunity where you can actually give yourself something give yourself a little something which is purely for you it's so easy to get totally tied up in the demands of work the demands of home the demands of life but to just say wait hang on i think all of those things might be easier might be better if i can just have whatever it is half an hour a week if that's all there is whether it's walking in the hills in Tasmania, whether it's going fishing, whether it's going to the men's table and listening to other men's stories, that time, which is purely about you as a person, is really, really valuable. And that's something that I certainly appreciate. Mm, yeah. Yeah, we see that a lot, Jeremy, that uh, lack of practice or habit for, for men, but maybe it's all people, to not prioritise some self-care, some time to invest in oneself. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, last question. Uh, I'd love to hear from each of you um, about the men's table.
helpful, and we've touched on it already in various sharing, um, and, and in what way it's been a healthy environment for you. For those on the um, audience who don't know much about the men's table, essentially it's a group of about 10 to 12 men. Uh, the same men meet once a month over dinner and a drink, and <coughs> it's a place uh, with a simple structure to ensure that there is a quality of listening, no fixing, as has already been discussed, and you know, a, an opportunity to build that sense of community and, and sharing uh, across the cohort of men. Um, in my own experience, uh, MT1 became like a band of brothers. Uh, you know, it was a very deep and strong sense of connection, I feel, with them. Um, would love to hear from each of you. Um, what, in what way has the men's table been a healthy environment for you? Andrew, kick us off. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, as I was saying earlier, it's not a natural thing for me to do. Uh, <clears throat> so it's been healthy in, in the sense of stretching me a little bit. And um, to, to be in a group of fellows that I didn't even know, uh, for starters. Plus, you know, I, I found myself, like during life and work and life in general, I seem to more easily talk to women for some reason um, than, than blokes. Uh, I can, like I had the ability to chat to blokes, but it, it was like some of your postcards said, you know, footy and shit. <laughs> Whereas the men's table isn't that. So um, um, it's been really good to be in a group of men um, and getting to know them and getting to listen. Like there's uh, amazing, amazing stories that we we share with each other. And every week is, com or no, every month, sorry, is completely unpredictable. And you, you might have a theme or something to start, but some personal sharing comes along and just blows it out of the water and say, so just go with that, you know, <laughs> because of the need on the night. Um, mm. So I found it very enjoyable, and 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 that I've been allowed to do that myself sometimes if that's what I need, you know. Mm. Um, I find it very helpful to talk about me, you know, first person, not just do you, 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 and and that that challenge to share about my life and myself and my f digging digging into feelings and things. I found mm. that very healthy, that I can very easily skip over that or avoid that in, in the rest of my life, you know, um, pay more attention to others. That, that's one of my ways that I'll, I'll do all that listening to others but not have someone uh, be in an environment where people can be listening to me and, and, sh and I can share. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Lawrence? So, so I've been part of the men's table now for over a year. And um, I mean, for, for me, it's you start for one for one reason, you start out of curiosity to understand. Um, and uh, after a year, it's, it's as you say, you, you um, we all need emotional support in our life. And uh, I think as men, uh, we're not encouraged to share from the heart. It's not something <clears throat> we do um, naturally and our culture doesn't, doesn't actually support that. So being able to come together with other men, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about the struggles that people go through. And it's a bit like a, um, I think I was saying this at our last men's table, it's, it, it's a bit like watching um, a soap opera or a drama in a, in a positive way because each month we come together and we see the next chapter of someone's life because we all go through these ups and downs and I've learned a lot the rules um, or the guidelines I should say rather than rules really support the culture of the men's table because it is about active listening it isn't about fixing as we as we've been saying and it is about sharing from the heart and when you actually bring that to life and it takes a while you know now after a year and i was on a, a two-day training course last week with with men from other men's tables the first time i'd actually uh, been in a room with uh, with men from others ta uh, other tables and i realized how we've all been trained in this culture 
because we're all used to active listening. We're all used to sharing in a particular way. Um, and it takes a while, but ultimately I think we all need in our lives a safe environment where we can share from the heart without fear of judgment. And that's really unique. That's really rare. And conversations are so important. Just being able to share and to feel listened to it's incredible. You know, so many people are struggling because they haven't got um, someone that they can talk to or someone who's actually willing to listen to them and not try and fix their problems, but just literally listen with their whole self. So for me, it's an, inc it's an incredible um, support system. You know, after 12, uh, after 12 months, 13 months, I think we've, you know, it evolves, culture changes after time. You know, you can't expect to be a band of brothers after, you know, one meeting. <laughs> but after 12 months, you start to go through and you learn about each other's lives in different, um, in different ways. So, um, yeah, so that's what I've got. And now it's become, you know, a big part of my life. It's funny how mm. after, after time it's, you know, it becomes a small part, like you shot once a month and that's it. And now, of course, it becomes a bigger part because it's opened up, I think, for me, the importance of men's health. You know, my work is around mm. well-being, but men, men um, do struggle um, so much with some of these issues. And a lot of it is um, because we're not able to share our feelings in a way which, um, which we need to. And the men's mm. table really um, provides that opportunity for mentorship, as you were saying, Andrew, for, for guidance, if you choose, and just literally for saying things. And I've, I've seen men who said things, shared feelings that they've never actually vocalized before. And that's incredibly healing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I would uh, only just underline what Lawrence just uh, spoke about. One of the, the, the most important things I think that I've learned from the men's table is that when people listen to you and they really, as you just said, Lawrence, they really listen, they don't just nod and drink their beer or whatever. It allows you to do the same thing back because you see the huge value in that. Then when somebody else tells an experience from what they're going through, you really, really listen in such a different way. You don't sit there and say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You listen, you actually hear that person and, and what they're talking about. And that on many occasions in our table, you, you kind of see the lights coming on in other people's eyes and they say, <clears throat> I'm not the only one. I am not the only one like that. And that is just huge. And you don't get that if you are just talking footy and shit. And a guy goes, yeah, yeah, my wife did that as well. It's rubbish. And you go on to the next subject, but there is no listening. That's mm. the big difference with the men's table. Mm. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, really, really great to hear your uh, affirmations and validation, I suppose, of, of the power of something quite simple, which is that safe place, a place to listen, a place to take some time out for ourselves um, and, and in that create uh, quite an extraordinary connection. And um, just to, to wrap up, I've really appreciated the conversation. I really enjoyed your kicking off, Andrew, around the just the, you know, the, the workload. It can get too much and, and we have to call ourselves out for it, but also your um, encouragement just to seek joy and love and, and beauty and growth in our lives and being fully human. So thank you for bringing that in. Um, Lawrence really enjoyed, appreciated how you sort of captured a lot of what we discussed in the first part around culture, just finding cultures that are healthy, whether it's work cultures, family cultures, um, you know, uh, uh, men's table cultures, um, really appreciated you bringing that in and that calling out of the safe place. And Jeremy, uh, your, your story of just your upbringing and the way you raised your children, creating that environment at home where people could be human, could be heard and listened and where there's healthy dialogue and respect for each other and how you've been able to take that forward um, into, into your life, but also practicing at the men's table and this idea of taking time out for ourselves. So thank you. Really great uh, insights and gems that you've all shared and appreciate you, um, you joining us today and also to the audience for coming along and and partaking. So thanks everyone and enjoy 
the rest of the week as Men's Health Week. And uh, let's keep an eye out for, for men and their health.